as you can tell by the video, we are at uh, TCT. We are in Washington, D.C. You know, there are a number of models that have been developed to identify patients at high risk for poor outcomes after TAVR, and that's really the issue. There are a number of these models, and so in the October 25th issue of Jack, there is a paper, Prediction of Poor Outcome After Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement. And to talk about this, I'm with Dr. Suzanne Arnold, who is an MD and Associate Professor at the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine and a clinical scholar at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. First off, what led you to do this study? I love this paper. Great. Um, well, I think that two things. One is, you're right, there are a lot of models, but most of those models are predicting mortality. Yes. And we think that's a huge issue for this population. Um, we know that quality of life is so important to these patients. Um, and a lot of these patients do never recover their functional status, and that's a big deal. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to predict poor outcome using a composite of, of quality of life along with mortality, because we think both of those are equally important to these patients prior to doing TAVR. Um, and so we had, had built this model and, and internally validated it in the partner high risk and, um, and uh, extreme risk patients. Um, but one of the things with, with prediction models that is a step that's usually um, often critically missed is external validation. Right. And before we start using these models clinically, we need to make sure that they work in a population of patients that they weren't derived in because models are inherently better in the population that you build them in. And so that's why we wanted to do this. A different device, a different population, does the model work? So what did you do? Um, what we did was we uh, took our existing prediction models that we had built in partner and we said, how well do they perform? in core valve. Um, do they uh, calibrate well? And that basically says, uh, is the uh, predicted risk of poor outcome uh, roughly equivalent to the actual uh, risk of outcome that you, poor outcome that you see? And then the second piece that we want to do that was really um, interesting with Corval is they had collected a lot of frailty markers, things like gait speed, grip strength, unintentional weight loss, oh, things nice. that we know are, are really important, at, at least in other studies, have always been shown to predict poor outcomes in this population. And we wanted to see, do those add to our model? Do they improve our, model, our model's ability to predict these? And what did you find? Uh, we first found that the models did quite well. Um, you know, the discrimination of these models are, are always a challenge. Um, it's moderate, but the calibration was excellent. Um, some of the best external validation um, studies that are results that we've seen. Um, when we looked at frailty markers, we found that, that first of all, frailty is incredibly common in these patients. 60% um, of the patients in core valve met criteria uh, for frailty using kind of community-based um, metrics, um, and 17% had a, a deficiency in an, an activity of daily living. Those are like things, ability to, to dress oneself, feed oneself, so really basic uh, uh, activities. Um, and when we looked at frailty, uh, it did add a little bit, but it, but it was fairly incremental. Um, if we looked at specific geriatric domains, disability in particular uh, did add to the model. So each activity daily living deficiency that the patient had increased the risk of having a poor outcome, as did unintentional weight loss. And this is really a, a pretty minimal amount. So five pounds in the prior six months of in unintentional weight loss did add on top of the model. So frailty by itself did not add a whole lot. By itself. Now recognizing that the model itself already had aspects of frailty, like functional status, um, quality of life, dementia, those were already in the model. And so if you looked at, I think, frailty by itself without any other thing in the model, it would, I'm sure it would be highly predictive. It's been shown in other studies to be predictive. But it's kind of the concept of does it add to what we're already looking at. And the things that, that were in our model are things that are already collected as part of TVT, and so they don't require a lot of additional measurement. Now, your ultimate goal was to develop models that could be deployed at the bedside. Mm -hmm. Do you think you have that now? I, I think so. We actually are starting to use them. Um, we've employed them at our valve clinic, and we're starting to um, uh, study up at um, in Columbia as well uh, to try to look to see if these models in valve clinic help improve decision making. Um, you know, the, the high risk patients, the ones that would be highest risk for these poor outcomes, we're seeing fewer and fewer of those patients as we move TAVR down, downstream. Um, but, um, but they still exist. And, and having 
something to support that decision process of whether or not we should do TAVR in these patients, I think will be helpful. You know, it's still October 2016, we're at, at TCT, and in our October issue of CSWN, it's on risk scores. Okay. That's the cover story. And it's, uh, you know, how many there are, how few get used. In this case, why aren't these scores being used, and what do you recommend? Um, I think there's a number of reasons why the scores don't aren't being used. First is the lack of external validation and, and the belief in the model that, um, that maybe it's not accurate um, or it doesn't apply to my population. I think that there's always um, um, uh, a bias in uh, perhaps this risk model. I don't need it. Right. I, I already know this information. Um, I think that's part of it, but then it's also hard to integrate that. In, in routine clinical care. You know, there are apps available, there are computer websites, but when you have to stop what you're doing in clinic and move to another platform and do something, um, it, I think it becomes m more challenging. And until we get things like, you know, the Chad's VASC, I think it is, is, a, is an example of a very successful risk score that's been able to implement. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of external validation they've done, the ability to, to know that we can't integrate that by ourselves that we need some sort of risk score to do that. Um, so there's the, the need factor, the ability to integrate it into routine clinical practice. So yours has now been validated. Is it easy to use? I, I mean, I think so. What, what we do generally is the, the valve coordinator um, completes all of the, the aspects of the risk score. And there, there's, oh, I mean, there's fewer than 10 things in this. Um, uh, prior to clinic, and then when they show up for clinic, they input the KCCQ, which is a key part of that. Um, and so we have the risk score available with the SDS side by side um, when the doctors go in to see the patient. I think what, in the cover story, one of the things we mentioned is, is I think that you get a, a lot of doctors with a lot of years of experience, and they think they can just eyeball mm -hmm. and estimate. Yes. Is there data to suggest that actually using the score is better? <laughs> I mean, we don't have data with our particular model, um, but there has been um, data in, in uh, cardiac risk scores and surgical risk scores that, that the risk scores are better um, than gut. Than um, gut yeah. I mean, there's always aspects of the risk scores that aren't in there, you know, and frailty is always, always a big one um, oh, yeah. that has been, you know, not harder to measure and harder to capture in a, in a, in a large registry to have, to have in a risk score. So the take home message here? Uh, I would say consider using risk scores. Um, I would say um, understand what are the high risk features of particular patients, functional status, kidney disease, lung disease, and that TAVR does not have to be used in everybody. And some patients may actually be better served by not doing TAVR. And it's, it's an important uh, endpoint. It's an important story to tell, I think, particularly in this day and age where it's been so successful, mm -hmm. but maybe not for everybody. Right. Now, this happens to be in the October 25th issue of JAX, so please take a look at the paper. And for CardioSource World News and CardioSource World News Interventions, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.